If you have ME-CFS or long COVID, you probably know what it's like to have a very foggy brain, to feel like you have difficulties with finding words, finishing sentences, with short or long-term memory, and many other things besides. But why exactly is this symptom occurring? In this video, I aim to share with you some amazing German research that offers a convincing explanation for brain fog in ME-CFS and long COVID. But first, if you are new to this channel, this is a place where I aim to offer simplified and accessible explanations of the research into ME-CFS and long COVID so that you can feel more empowered in understanding these conditions. It's also a place where I aim to talk about my own experiments with different treatments in trying to improve my condition as an ME-CFS patient. Now, brain fog, the feeling of being very vacant inside one's head, of having difficulty finding words, concentrating, maybe even difficulties with coordination or feeling like your bodily movements are slowing down, so-called psychomotor uh, slowing. Um, I often joke to myself when I find yet again that I have left the freezer door open that I probably have early onset Alzheimer's. And although I say that in jest, I think a lot of ME-CFS and long COVID patients will know what I mean. Now, if you look through the YouTube sphere, and really I'm talking more about people who are not reading the research in relation to ME-CFS, but who are offering their own explanations for the condition, you often see things like, well, perhaps it's an increase of this neurotransmitter, or it's an absence of that one, or brain fog is simply all a result of a so-called hypersensitive nervous system issue. But what does the research actually say about this problem? Let me introduce you to the work of Professor Carmen Scheibenbogen and Professor Klaus Wirth. These two German researchers have collaborated together over the last few years in order to map out a whole model for the pathophysiological mechanisms that underlie ME-CFS. I think their research is brilliant. And when I first came across it a few years ago and really understood it, I felt at long last like I was no longer living in the dark in relation to my condition. Now, I hope to do other videos all about their research, but today I'm just going to be talking about one of their papers, which focuses on the neurological problems within these illnesses. And that paper is called An Attempt to Explain the Neurological Symptoms of Myalgic Encephalomyelitis slash Chronic Fatigue. And so from that paper, I'm going to share with you now five reasons why brain fog happens in ME-CFS and long COVID. So reason number one is not actually anything to do with the brain itself. Rather, Scheibenbogen and Wirth point out that it is the nature of the illness in the body as a whole, all of its different pathophysiological mechanisms, which also create a dysfunction in the brain. Now, in their view, ME-CFS is characterized by a state of global hypoperfusion. Now, what does that mean, you might well ask? It means that globally, throughout the whole body, there is a state of low blood perfusion. And perfusion means seeping into. So there's a reduction in blood seeping into many different parts of the body, the muscles, the organs, and of course, because the brain is also part of the body, into the brain. Now, I'll go into some of the reasons for why this hypoperfusion is occurring in a moment, but for now, we can see how, if that is indeed the core nature of ME-CFS, it makes sense that brain function would also be impaired negatively. So this is what Wirth and Scheibenbogen have to say. In our unifying hypothesis of the pathophysiology of ME-CFS and the pathophysiology of the skeletal muscle disturbances, there is no need to assume a specific neurological pathology to explain the neurological symptoms. These are sufficiently explained by a stringent application of the ideas on the pathomechanisms already put forward in our previous two hypothesis papers. In the following, we will discuss in detail how they could affect the brain to produce the various neurological symptoms. Therefore, all of the reasons that follow ultimately come from the very nature of ME-CFS itself as an illness which reduces blood perfusion throughout the body. And this therefore brings us to reason number two, reduced cerebral blood flow or a reduction in blood flow in the brain. Now, if the brain is not receiving an adequate supply of blood and oxygen and all that that entails, it is, of course, 
going to reduce its functioning capacity. And in particular, Wirth and Scheibenbogen point out that there are several possible reasons for this. The first is an impairment in vasodilation of the blood vessels within the brain. So vasodilation is the opening up of blood vessels. And a key part of their hypotheses is that there is a desensitization of vasodilation receptors on the blood vessels. In other words, the normal instructions that a blood vessel would receive in order to open up when it needs to physiologically is not working properly. As a result, in this case, the brain does not receive adequate blood supply. Now, this problem with the receptors is partly to do with autonomic dysfunction, which we'll talk about later, but also to do with autoimmunity and autoantibodies. I will talk more about those in a later video. There are a few other problems that also contribute to this reduced cerebral blood flow. For example, low blood volume, which we know is a major problem in ME-CFS and long COVID, in which patients do not have enough blood because of pathological mechanisms within their illness. Now, I've done a whole previous video on why that occurs, which is now up above. Furthermore, there can also be damage to the lining of the blood vessels, which can further impede blood flow. So all of these pathomechanisms can explain other findings we have had into ME-CFS which show a very significant reduced cerebral blood flow. Indeed, by well over 20, even 25% in some circumstances. The third reason for brain fog in ME-CFS could be an increase in intracranial hypertension. Now, this actually means an increase in blood pressure within the brain. Averth and Scheibenbogen point out that a previous study has found that 83% of ME-CFS patients appear to have this problem. And furthermore, when you have this problem, it will increase the low blood perfusion in the brain even more. This is what Wirth and Scheibenbogen have to say. A rise in intracranial pressure is at the expense of cerebral perfusion pressure, which may have the strongest effect at the level of capillary blood flow. Possibly for this reason, intracranial hypertension is also associated with cognitive impairment. Now, for various reasons, Wirth and Scheibenbogen also suggest that the other pathomechanisms that are central to their model of ME-CFS can contribute, i.e. lead to, the development of intracranial hypertension. We now come to reason number four for the brain fog, and that is the autonomic dysfunction or dysautonomia that is so common in these kinds of conditions. In this case, when you are in this excessive sympathetic state, there is an increase of stress chemicals being released by the nervous system. These stress chemicals have a vasoconstricting effect. In other words, they are tightening the blood vessels. When you have all of these kinds of chemical messengers being released, they will further inhibit the vasodilation of the blood vessels in the brain, thereby increasing the lower blood perfusion there. So in this case, the authors write that chronic stress could also desensitize this inhibiting autoreceptor to enhance catecholamine release in activating noradrenergic nuclei of the brainstem, like the locus ceruleus, thereby causing arousal and increased vigilance, and in the sympathetic nervous system leading to enhanced vasoconstrictor output. Now, Wirth and Scheibenbogen make a very important point. Once you have the chronic hypoperfusion in the brain that's present because of all of these reasons, that then establishes a vicious cycle because the chronic hypoperfusion is itself a stressor on the brain, is itself a stressor on the nervous system because the brain and the nervous system desires an adequate supply of oxygen and blood in order to function well. So once these mechanisms become established, they really just feed into each other keep the stress response going. Now, this is quite contrary to what a lot of YouTubers say, which is that the only thing that's going on in these illnesses is a hypersensitive nervous system issue. This is simply inaccurate. And now we move to the fifth and final reason for brain fog, and that is hypocapnia. Now, that means low carbon dioxide levels. Now, carbon dioxide is a very important gas. It is not a waste gas contrary to the popular misconception. Carbon dioxide 
is actually a gas that vasodilates the blood vessels, it opens them up. And so if you have a state of hypocapnia, the blood vessels in your brain, for another reason, will not be able to open adequately and allow for blood perfusion. Now, according to Wirth and Scheibenbogen, this hypocapnia is largely a response to changes in blood acidity, as well as um, the increased lactic acid, that then results in a lowering of CO2 and an increase in hyperventilation as a compensatory mechanism. But there you have it. There are five reasons for the brain fog that is so characteristic of ME-CFS and long COVID. Firstly, that the very nature of the pathomechanisms within these illnesses creating a state of hypoperfusion or low blood perfusion throughout the body must necessarily affect the blood hypoperfusion in the brain. And so we get what is called a state of low cerebral blood flow that creates many of the cognitive issues within the condition. In addition, we then get, probably also because of that problem, a rise in intracranial hypertension, as well as a lowering of carbon dioxide reserves in the body, which therefore lowers further the vasodilation within the brain. And finally, of course, there is the autonomic dysfunction, which itself has a vasoconstricting, vasotightening effect on the blood vessels in the brain, although this problem is also maintained by all the other ones. Now, one final very important caution. As with all my videos, nothing is to be taken as medical advice, but I wish to make one very important point. As I have said throughout this video, according to this model, there is a lack of vasodilation within the brain. However, Professor Klaus Wirth does make the point that in MECFS, there is a lack of vasodilation in the muscles and brain and several organs, but this problem is not usually happening with the return of blood flow to the heart. In those blood vessels, the problem is often the opposite, a lack of vasoconstriction. Therefore, on the basis of this model, he cautions against taking any vasodilating medications, because while that may help the problems in the muscles or brain, it could worsen the problem with the return of blood flow to the heart. I hope you found this video helpful. Please comment down below with your thoughts. Does this make sense to you? Is this what it feels like to you to have brain fog? What have you found that's helpful for brain fog? You'll also see down below a link to a free medical hypothesis that I have written about the causes of thirst in MECFS, long COVID and POTS, as well as details about my consultation service if you wish to discuss these kinds of ideas with me in more detail, as well as discuss with me about treatments with which I'm more personally familiar, such as help apheresis or brain retraining. So that's it for today. I look forward to seeing you in the next video.